Good morning, everybody. I'm not going to wish you a happy Memorial Day. This is one holiday that is not intended to be a celebration, a happy occasion, although in many ways that's kind of what it's become. Memorial Day is a solemn holiday, a day of remembrance. So I'm going to share with you five things not to do this Memorial Day weekend. One, don't wish people a happy Memorial Day. This isn't Christmas. It's Memorial Day, a day of solemn remembrance. Hopefully this won't rub some of you the wrong way, but don't thank veterans for their service on Memorial Day. That's what Veterans Day is for in November, the often overlooked holiday. Memorial Day is a day to remember those who are no longer with us, who have fallen in service to their country. Don't disregard its importance. We can oftentimes get caught up in Memorial Day sales, thinking of that lazy boy, that new that's on sale now, all the hot dogs that we can buy because they're cheap. But don't disregard it for what it is. People tend to think that it marks the beginning of summer, and probably it does. But that's not why the holiday was designated as such. And in the same sense, don't forget that it exists. Don't completely disregard it and forget those who have fallen in service to our country. And last but not least, don't let politics keep you from rendering respect for those that gave their lives for our freedoms. It doesn't matter what side of the political framework you land on. Men and women have gone to war and given their lives in sacrifice for freedom. And that's what this holiday is about. It goes back to the Civil War when men were left in the fields to just die and no proper burial was even conceived of. All wars before that, that's what happened. Where people fell, that's usually where they laid. And it wasn't until the Civil War and actually at the Gettysburg Address where Abraham Lincoln gave that formal address that it began to take hold that we need to do something to show better respect for our fallen soldiers. And out of that, now, over the years of all the wars that have been fought and all the, the lives that have been lost, there is now an actual system in place to either bury people in proper cemeteries where they died, or if the family wishes, they can bring the bodies home and receive a burial here. That is showing proper respect for those who have given their lives for our country. The soldier's sacrifice is one of going to battle. And oftentimes, soldiers are confronted that any time that they enter into active duty, that they may not come home again. As such, they are often required to complete a last will and testament. They are often required to write a letter to a one that can be passed on in the event that they don't return home. The whole reason for dog tags is so that they can identify people two dog tags, one that remains with the body at all times. The soldier's sacrifice, giving one's life for one's country. Now many people may not enter into war as a soldier thinking about that they're giving their life or possibly giving their lives for their country. They go to boot camp, they're trained, and then they're sent off to serve. 
And in their units, they become a band of brothers. And now, a band of brothers and sisters, oftentimes. And they know that they're fighting shoulder to shoulder with someone. And they know that there may come a time they may have to lay down their life for that person that they're fighting shoulder to shoulder with. That they're willing to sacrifice their life for someone who they consider to be a friend, a brother in arms, or a sister in arms. That is the soldier's sacrifice. Willing to go to put their life on the line to give up the connection with their families, to be apart for long periods of time, sometimes not being there when a child is born or when a loved one dies, and still sacrificing all of that in order to defend freedom and to defend their brothers and sisters in arms. There is no other kind of sacrifice like that, except that that was given by our Lord and Savior. He gave us the example of what it means to sacrifice. In John chapter 15, the Gospel of John, John is considered the apostle of love because he talks a lot about love. Very befitting because his church talks a lot about love. We'll put it right above the door. What does love require of me? Jesus was about love. It wasn't about romantic love. It was about official love. And he even tells his disciples in chapter 15 starting at verse 12. He gives them a new commandment. Now, the only person who could give commandments was God. And for Jesus to say, I give you a new commandment, he was aligning himself with the Father. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And he commanded them what? To love one another. Can you imagine what our communities would be like if we just followed that simple command? Love one another. He commands us to love others as he loves us. Now, quite frankly, I don't know about you. Right. I oftentimes mess it up. To love like Jesus loved? To love completely, unconditionally? That isn't something that I can do on my own. The only way that I could possibly love as Jesus loves is if I had Jesus living in me and empowering me to love the way he loves. A sacrificial kind of love that only Jesus can give us. <coughs> Great kind of love is sacrificial. Sacrifice means going without something for the good of someone else even if it means giving up your life for your friends. That's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for his friends. He called his disciples his friends. He called everyone who followed his commands his friends. He called me his friend, and he calls you his friend, because he laid down his life for you. where Jesus talks about laying down his life, we read about the good shepherd, the shepherd's sacrifice, and how Jesus related himself to the good shepherd. We go back to John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hired hand, he who is not the shepherd... One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hired hand flees because he has a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, which are not in this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. The Good Shepherd. The good shepherd owns the sheep. They know him. If you've ever seen any of the videos on Facebook and YouTube or whatever, they actually demonstrate that. They have people come up to a fence and they call, they call the sheep and the sheep just keep milling about and nibbling away at the grass and everything. And the shepherd comes along and he calls them and all the sheep flock to his voice. When we know Jesus' voice, we follow him. Follow him wherever he wants to lead us. This scripture is telling because it's not only talking about Jesus being there, the but he is talking about there is other sheep that are not part of this fold. He's talking about the Gentiles. And he's talking about the fact that both will come together. And Gentile, all hearing his voice and following him. Jesus said four times for his sheep. The wolf coming and the hired hand. Their sheep. The religious order of the day. Because they were in their own self. Keep know him. The predator, the wolf. From the predators of sin. We, if we want to be good sheep, <laughs> come on, sheeple. If we want to be good sheep, we want to follow our shepherd, our good shepherd. You see, it doesn't matter what it is that we carried in with us today. It doesn't matter where we're at in this journey. It doesn't matter how much pain and how much suffering it begins with Jesus. You can wallow in your self-pity. You can wallow in how your life has gone. You can, you can wallow in all of the mess of this world and the way this world is. But I'm telling you, it begins with Jesus and who Jesus is to you. Is he going to be your good shepherd? Because once you figure out who Jesus is to you, everything else. We were not intended 
to go through this life isolated and alone. Jesus came into this world because God said, I want to repair the broken relationship. I am going to heal the chasm that came through the original sin. I'm going to repair that and I'm going to give my son, my one and only son, so that all who believe with me, can be in right relationship with me. Jesus came to give the ultimate sacrifice. And it is only through our relationship with Jesus that we will have because everything that we need is in him. Regardless of what you're suffering with, regardless of what baggage you're carrying, Jesus can overcome it. But if you want to continue to wallow in it and believe that you can handle it and believe that it's all about you, then yeah, life is going to be difficult. Because Jesus is the one who can fill all the voids, who can fill all the empty spaces, and can make us whole. And on this Memorial Day, as we remember those who gave their lives, who laid down their lives, it does us well to remember the sacrifice. Went to the cross. Innocent. To take on the world. To be made whole again. And in right relation. We had another announcement of people being killed. It seems to have been a rash of that lately. <coughs> New York, California, and now Texas. We are uncertain what actually happened in those situations. We don't know what people threw themselves in front of someone else to possibly try and save them and giving up their lives. But we know that sacrifice is real. To lay down one's life for a friend. To give up one's life for another. We, as Christians, as Christ followers, are to lead by example. We are to be the ones who are expressing love in this world. People should be able to look at a church and churches across this country and see love, not hatred, not division, not disunity. We are defined by a creator and a savior who laid down his life. We have to do better. We have to be the ones to lead by example. To be willing to go without something for the good of someone else. That is sacrifice. Let us pray. People in our midst. Continue to struggle. To look for healing. Father, we praise you for the presence of Jane Peterson in our midst today. So happy to have her with us. And Father, we, we pray for those who can be with us today. We pray for Deb Richard and we pray healing on her back. 
We pray for Doyle Bain as he relocates to Reed and has this long journey. Uh, on his feet, returning. For surgery and coming through that well and Aunt Nancy Barlow. Again, and God, we just pray for healing over that. We pray that there won't be long term effects and that they will be able to. Father, last week we continue to see the headlines and we read about the, the damage that was done and the, the deadly violence. Lord, I want to share a prayer written by Grace Claus that I believe sums up. Some of us are paralyzed with fear. We hear about bombs and guns and death and our throats close in terror. We fear for our own lives, for the lives of our children and our children's children. We don't know what has happened to the world we thought we knew. We who fear confess our fear and ask for your forgiveness. Fill us with your love, for your perfect love casts out fear. You are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. And we pray for the people whose lives are truly endangered, who have more cause to fear. Would you make safe havens for them? Would you lead them out of the valley of the shadow of death into places of light and life? Some of us are incensed with hatred. The wars and rumors of war incite us to start our own. Our instinct to be overcome by evil, to take vengeance into our own hands. We who hate confess our hate and ask for your forgiveness. Warm our hearts with compassion and help us pursue peace. Grant us your wisdom as we seek your kingdom by turning our cheek and walking another mile. And we pray for the people whose hatred has led to death. As you did with the Apostle Paul, would you encounter them on the road? Would you, with your very presence, transform threats and murder into lives lived for you? Some of us just feel numb. The rising death tolls spin past our eyes, but our hearts no longer read them. Years of images of violence have dulled our senses. Another incident, we don't even flinch anymore. We who are numb confess our numbness and ask for your forgiveness. Sharpen our senses, cause us to care, even if that means feeling the pain of heartbreaking sadness. Teach us empathy, help us weep with those who weep. And we pray for the people who weep. Would you be their consolation? You know the pain of betrayal, of abandonment, of death. Would you heal wounds of all kinds? Would you also someday give them cause to laugh? On that day, we will laugh with those who laugh. Lord of all, gather us up, your creatures, your world, and bring an end to the violence. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now let us...